So we have uh, Ricky and Gianna, who is going to talk to us about a hardware startup at Tech in China. And I'm going to let him tell you. Uh, yep. So, as I said, my name is Ricky. This is actually my wife is in the audience. She's also been part of the project. Uh, and the project is called the Philo. And if you've read the abstract, uh, I said that I was going to talk about ARM and FPG and talk also about a little bit about the China, doing business in China, doing a startup in China. So uh, why should you care about this talk? So I'm going to, if you've never built an ARM platform, then this could be interesting. Some hints on how to proceed and uh, new ideas on embedded system. So I think we have some interesting concept that we brought uh, on the platform and also learning a little bit about uh, how to actually build, get the, the platform manufactured in China. So people ask me why, so I'm French Canadian, I'm originally from Montreal, um, and people ask me why China? Why are you in China? So I think it's because China is moving, it's booming, it's uh, lots of things happening in China. And uh, obviously, with such a large population, both in the country and in the city of Shanghai, like as you know, um, there's lots of interesting people that you can meet and do project with. So Ch Shanghai is astonishing as a city. So if you've never visited it, you should check it out. Um, so they just got beaten by Beijing in terms of subway line, but but yes, and it started. But they started building it in '95. Okay, in '95 they had no subway system, and now they have one of the the second biggest, and probably they're going to go get back first soon in the world. It's completely astonishing, and uh, world busiest port, lots of container traffic. So people often talk about Shenzhen in terms of uh, manufacturing, but actually Shanghai has a lots of factories in the surrounding Jiangsu, and they ship a lots of container traffic. So really good. Now there's some uh, downsides to being in China. <laughs> so typically, um, there's two big things that annoys uh, expats living in China. So that's the uh, air quality, which has been particularly bad in the last two months. And what I found really interesting is to find the equivalent uh, air quality index uh, standard for Australia is 25. And they, they, like, there's these pages saying, oh, if it increases by 10%, it's going to increase that, and it's going to be terrible. But actually, you know, <laughs> we're living in cities that have much terrible air quality. So something that they, they'll need to fix soon. The second part that's really annoying to expat is censorship. So we don't get the internet that other people get. So we live in a kind of intranet. And um, I mean, some of the things are expected, social networks. Uh, but other things such as Blogspot and GitHub, which was blocked for a day, are really, really annoying for developers, right? So you, you, you try as a software engineer, myself, it's, it makes it really difficult to, to do research because then you have to get the VPN on, the VPN doesn't work out the time, it's slower, so it's like very, very annoying. But that's the, that's the reality of it. Now there's upside, one of the biggest upside, Taobao! Taobao is this huge uh, market that uh, is as many, many, many different uh, companies selling on. So it's kind of Amazon, but it's actually individual stores that are selling parts. So you can find anything on Taobao. So typically when people ask us, say, could you find this? You say, yes, it's on Taobao. We don't even check. It's, it's there, guaranteed. <laughs> so that's just an example of what um, the big benefit of doing business in China is, from a hardware building perspective, is that uh, the supply chain, right? So we can get all the parts and all the components quickly and have them delivered uh, mostly next day. And that's been like a big part of what Minlin has done for the hardware startup, um, is to source these components, right? Because you need to go online and talk to the merchant and get them delivered and find the right parts and make sure that they, they get on time and then they get them tested but it's a lot easier to do in China. So, <clears throat> so I was in Shanghai and um, I had a job and then I quit my job to, to do hackerspace because I found that really interesting being in the, the hardware side of things. 
and um, you know, lots of crazy ideas and meeting lots of very interesting people. And one of those persons, Xiu Li, who's uh, was one probably one of the best hardware designer in the world, uh, came to the space and we started talking about projects. And and we decided let's do a hardware startup. So you know, very easy recipe. Just these three dots here and then profit, right? No problem. So inspiration. So for people who don't know the Arduino platform, it's uh, it's a very it, it has made uh, interfacing with sensors and control actuator very easy. It has made it so possible for people to build a physical device uh, at a very at a very low price. It has a very easy to use software environment, and that's a little bit where we started. So hackerspaces use a lot of these Arduino platform in various projects. So we decided, let's see if we can take that to the next stage, which is this ARM and FPG platform. I've got a sample here. You know, that adds some of the functionality that's been missing to turn uh, some of those hardware control device into network uh, control device. So we're combining ARM and FPG together. And what we want to achieve is to have the CPU with the ARM Linux uh, operating system taking care of the high level logic, the networking, which is all stuff that's very asynchronous, right? And then give to the FPGA uh, the task of uh, doing PWM or doing uh, PIDs or tasks that are really real time. So everything open source, open hardware. Um, What's PID in that context? It's a proportional integral derivative, so it's typically okay. So you, okay, yeah, it's for the control system, so sorry, you can. Sorry, you say PID, my mind goes to process ideas. Ah, oh, sorry, yeah, it led, uh, yeah, Linux conference, right? And um, I've tried to put smaller, like it's. I want to use JavaScript everywhere, right? So why? Because a lot of people that are. Uh, interested by that platform, by internet connected device, might have a background as a web developer. So they're looking for something that they know to, to do the front end, the server side, and control the hardware. So we could do robotics, 3D printers, maybe some signal processing, software SDR, and uh, internet connected device. And some of the spec that I, I guess it's not, uh, so it's a very nice piece of hardware, I can tell you, maybe we can talk more about that, you can look at the spec online. But basically it's, a, it's the ARM CPU, uh, that is a system on a chip, so it has a lots of built-in functionality, uh, with 128 meg of RAM. And then there's the FPGA itself, which is about, uh, it's Altera Cyclone 4, it has about 15,000 logic units. So not it's a mid-size uh, FPGA, and it's we've selected these components to do a good balance between uh, power consumption and functionality. So different subsystems. So I think I've I've touched on that, and this is the kind of system diagram. So one of the big benefit here is that um, lots of the projects that we see use a, a PC computer and have an Arduino computer and a serial connection between both. But that kind of limits uh, the bandwidth that you have. So it, in our system, because the cycle for FPGA is, appears as a memory bus device, then we get a lot more potential traffic and I.O. between the, the Linux operating system and the different I.O. device. And because it's a reprogrammable uh, piece of hardware, we can put any kind of virtual electronic design that lets us interface and do uh, logic processing on the input outputs. So there's different peripheral that we're working on, different projects that we could control. There's like generic uh, shield system to expand the functionality. In this case, this does, um, this is for Seed Studio. They have a, a Grove, sh Grove uh, standard interface. So they connect sensors to standardized connectors. And we've built the shield that has uh, analog ADC, uh, analog to digital converter, and also digital uh, connections. So that you can just, people could just use that shield and then plug in the sensors and actuators directly. Okay, so software wise, so I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because it's, it's the high level, uh, what we want to offer to the user. 
But basically, the concept is we want to make this an internet connected device. So everything in the browser, right? So including um, the management of the system and also the development and running like the UI. The, so lots of the stuff is going to be running in your browser and be served by uh, the little <coughs> device. <clears throat> so we're, we're trying to take advantage of the fact that um, Linux has a very good networking stack and, and browsers are very powerful. So we can, we can take advantage of that. So you can log into it with GitHub. Um, so security-wise, it's very pretty open system because we're assuming that this is really just uh, your, you know, you have the hardware next to you, so you have full control of it. But uh, we use we use the integration with GitHub for to ensure like source controls and stuff like that. Um, so you can you can do different tasks, and the idea is so this is just there. There's nothing behind this, but. The idea is to create all the, the equivalent functionality that you would get in your desktop environment to control the system. Um, and you can add application. So you can check out from your available repositories. You can you know, uh, add them locally and you can run them. So it's not the nicest. I have a much nicer example application now, but you can get it. And this is, this is a Cloud9 web development environment. So in your browser, on your laptop, you connect to the device and you start up the, the, the web development environment and you can start editing programs and that, that serve both as the user interface, as the server side, but also as the control part for the hardware. So, okay, so once we've... Hmm? So this is supposed to be YouTube. Okay. A little bit of a drink. So the most fun part of this project was actually spending these two weeks at the factory and getting a small batch of the, the hardware assembled. And it's very interesting. So. So we went there and the factory is, uh, we were set up in a room that's unheated. So it's like really cold for two weeks in December. And uh, they, so they bring us, um, so they, they, they produced it and then brought us the boards and we started testing them. So the, the, the great thing is the first board we got was like totally working fine, you know, great. And so we're super happy, wow, this is going great. We test the second board, not working. Third board, it blew up like our test uh, processing card. So we're like, what the is going on? And so what we found out is that um, it's really, really important. So you can't, the yield, the total yield at the originally was 10%. So 10% of our boards were actually working boards. All the rest of them had issues from like bad soldering or components that were, you know, rotated or a whole bunch of issues that, that we had to solve, basically. We had to test them, isolate the issue, and then get them tested. So luckily, we had the help, because I'm a software engineer. My wife is a software engineer. We have no idea, right, of most of this stuff. And we had the help from the company uh, that's our partner, Meteoroid, in Shanghai to do the testing. But so this video shows a little bit um, the actual factory so assembling with all the components, and what I'll, what is interesting is so once it's done, they take, so most of the assembly is done by machines, but the problem is because some of the components are so few, they need to, they do a hand assembly of it, and that's where all the problems are actually. <laughs> so the, the, because of the, you know, it's either components that are failing when you get them, or it's because they've assembled by hand. So key here, what's interesting, the conclusion is if you can scale your production up, if you can do a lot more units, you can actually get less problems because the machine is much more reliable than uh, the little factory girls that, you know, they, they, they're very good at soldering, but they don't necessarily know how the component is supposed to fit. So, and there's a whole process of x-ray uh, of the components. So you just stand next to the machine and it's like x-ray on and you stand there for 15 minutes looking at the computer. It's really interesting. <laughs> okay, so that's the video. Um, 
Hopefully I can move to the... Okay. So what's the software stack? So this is where we're getting in the Linux conference um, you know, content. I'm going to look at the time. Okay, 27. So this is, this is the, the, what we had to build, basically. So because when you get the hardware, you know, it's kind of useless. It's just a piece of hardware. What you need to put on is the software to get it running and get all the functionality out of it. And that's what we've been working um, for the last, last few months. So the first part is the bootloader. So this is, you'll notice, it's not U-boot, it's M-boot. So it's our own um, you know, bootloader. Then there's the FPG image, which is written in Verilog. Uh, Linux kernel, of course. Debian Wheezy, which has been great. Like they have a full uh, set of packages for our platform, the RML uh, packages. So it's really easy actually to assemble an operating system for, for a new platform like this. Um, and then we've built like a driver to expose the, the functionality to talk to the FPGA. And uh, so then the rest of it is just the application side of it, right? We needed to write the JavaScript engine and uh, management console and the browser ID, which we're actually reusing a lot of the, the components that are already out there. So yeah, this is once it's booted, so it looks like this. So what, how do we get there? Um, so this is the, the boot process. So the so it's a lot of like the development is a lot of looking at the and reading the data sheet. So so obviously this system on the chip has a very extensive uh, data sheet, and I think that's one of the difference between uh, the world of electronics and software. Is electronics is a much better defined uh, interface and specification. So it's really really important to read through and uh, understand the full data sheet. And so this is, the software is built on top of that process documented in the data sheet of the system on chip. And the key part, you know, this is, this is where it gets fun. Once you get there and you do the boot Linux, you set the, the in-memory power meter, you load the kernel up, and then you pass a control to the kernel. And this is, this is where it's happening. So to do that, we've, we forked the Linux uh, source, and luckily, uh, lots of the work was done for us because Atmel has uh, development kits that they use. So ours is just slightly different from the development kits. So we could uh, we could use a lot of what the functionality was. What we needed to do is to add some of the FPGA uh, memory device address <laughs> into it. So we created this file board tabby. Tabby is the, the code name for the project. And we also, um, so this is what it looks like. Also, the, this is the memory address, the remap uh, devices. So this is changes that are specific. When you select Lofilo Tabby in the, the menu config, you, you get these particular settings. So there's just different pins that are being used to achieve some of the functionality that they're doing. <coughs> And uh, we have a configuration file, of course, and you'll see like a lot of it is enabling the 1891 architecture. So this, and and then there's a particular. So what, how I did it to build it because there's a complicated process to set up the SD card is to create my own make file and uh, do a lot of the setup. Uh, for copying, for example, the grid.rbf is the FPGA image, and uh, the bootloader is boot.bin, and then we also install all the modules in the kernel uh, when we compile it to set up the NFS directory. Okay, so one interesting thing is that these settings are not, you know, you, it has an impact, right? So I've been, I was playing around with slob and slob. I don't. It's not exactly the same to me. And I was so I was using Spawn, but for the for some reason with the production machine, uh, some kind of uh, race condition that's that's been known before. If you go to the user forum, uh, came up when we were testing. So what I did is just disable and go back to Spawn. So it's really important, to, I think, to keep track of what changes you're making to a configuration file because you can really get into areas of the kernel that has, haven't been maybe as well tested, uh, particularly in combination with your platform. So it's really important to be able to do that tracking. <clears throat> uh, 
So we, I use the make file to, to build the kernel. So it, under it, it's, it does most of the same task that we, that we see when we build a regular kernel, but it's also copying all the file to an NFS directory that I can use for testing. So I export this. And um, so this has made it a lot easier because since creating the SD card is very slow, you know, you want a, a mean to be able to test changes to your operating system. So if you change the init system or you add a service or things like that, you don't want to have to rewrite the SD card. So what we do is we put everything on NFS and we use NFS boot on the kernel side to, uh, to use that OS image. And so the, the other part is, so since you would be using that in different networking environment, you want to be able to find that uh, NFS export. And so for that, I started using uh, Avai, so zero conf, bonjour, um, publishing of services to find, find these and look them up and then execute the, the kernel against that NFS uh, mount. So this is what the kexec, so I have a script. So when I boot the default SD card and I want to try a test a new image or a new kernel, then I use, um, I look up the NFS uh, location and I use kexec on the kernel to, uh, to boot that particular system. So the parameters in this case, so you see 128 gets its IP by DHCP and I'm using the great, uh, what I consider a like really great system D, uh, especially for embedded system, and all the NFS root parameters. The other thing I'm doing is that actually that directory that I'm exporting as NFS is all under Git control, so that I'm able to track the changes and make experimental changes in terms of what services or what software I want to put on. So this is this is just an extract of what um, the history, the log history for this particular system. So obviously at some point I'm going to need to go back and, and package an image that can be installable from the ground up. But for development purposes, uh, being able to use Git and revert changes uh, to application that have been installed is really, really useful. So to create the actual SD, the micro SD card, because on this system, Everything boots from a tiny little micro SD card. So the, both the bootloader, the operating system, and the swap is on this micro SD. And to cr so it's, it can get a little bit complicated to get it set up properly with the proper partitioning and uh, all this ne necessary software. So I've written this script that you can find on GitHub again. So everything else is on GitHub uh, to create this partition of the system. And one key problem I face, it's, it seems impossible to create from Linux, a, a, and I don't know why, I've, I've spent many, many hours trying different combination to come up with, um, the, because the first partition needs to be a DOS partition, because the, the CPU will load the bootloader program from that DOS partition. And, and the, what's interesting is that it only works if the partition has been formatted on a Windows system. If I try to format it on a Linux system, it just doesn't see it. So there's probably a bug of some kind in, in the firmware. But because of that, I've had actually to clone uh, partitions to make it work. So there's a the cloning option here to do it from, a, from an image of a working micro SD card. Can you yes. also set the bootable flag on the partition as well? Yes, I've tried. Yeah. I've tried so many different options and it's just like I couldn't get it to work. And I think it, I mean, I started investigating what the differences were at the file system level, but I couldn't figure out like what made it different really. You're so, right, it's probably a bug. That, 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 that what you've created is valid, it's just the firmware doesn't handle it. Exactly. So, so either talk to, at, I need to talk to Atmel. Or, you know, because it's ridiculous, right? I needed to go just for that, to go to a Windows system just to format that partition. So it's kind of sad that they never tested from a Linux formatted partition. So the next step is, um, so, so obviously, so now you've got the Linux kernel booting, you've got your basic operating system, now you want to interact with your FPGA, right? So you've got like this piece of hardware that's memory map 
but you want to expose that so that your user can write to the IA. And because it's an FPGA, it's going to be very dynamic. Right? So that's the difference here. Is the hardware could actually be changing under you. The memory location and what does what is not fixed. So we needed to find a way or to find an approach to, to support that. And so we've, we've created, we've went, we tried to go uh, to something more generic. So we're using a higher performance. So we're using a kernel driver that exposes a memory map interface. So simply take the memory from the hardware device and expose it in user space directly so that you can just write to it as you will at any other memory location. So you get a pointer and at different offset inside that memory, you're actually accessing different function in the FPGA. So, <clears throat> in addition to that, so we've got a use debug it fast to create a file system hierarchy so you can actually do some debugging in the command line. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I don't actually understand what's going on here, but I did because I, so I had to search a lot to actually do the remap from, from the hardware memory to the, to the user space. And if people can explain to me what's, everything that's going on here, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> but it's working, so I'm happy. Uh, and this is the function we're calling, so just for reference. So once we've, once we've done that, then there's, there's also the aspect of the Lofilo management console. So we built this um, based on uh, Node.js. So Node.js is either people like really, really dislike it, or people really like it, I think. It's uh, one of these things. But for our purposes, since we wanted something JavaScript, to, both on the client and the server and the control, to make it easier for potentially for user to use, that's what we went for. And we're using something called a framework called a socket stream that creates application, a web application, makes it easier to create web web application. So we we start that um, application on the server, and it exposes internally. Socket stream works with the RPCs. So we've got a, a bunch of uh, name, so in the dictionary, name, name RPCs that you can call from the client side, which is in your browser, right? And you can get that information and control the system uh, remotely through the network. And of course, so once we get the Lofilo management console, once we've made it, we need to run it. And so what I found really uh, great is uh, system D uh, services. So it makes it really easy to create a relatively complex uh, configuration file and, uh, and run it uh, consistently. It's system D has great features such as uh, being able to get logs from individual processes and track all the process being spawned uh, <laughs> under one particular service. And also, the, the other fun feature for an embedded system is the ability to collect a boot chart. So this can be done in other ways, of course, but in system D, this functionality is built in. And this is really useful because when you, when you build an embedded system, you want the fastest boot possible, right? Because you might be building a system that's going to be in a situation where there's going to be a lot of rebooting going on, on and off, on and off, on a reliable power supply. So this shows you, so the kernel takes eight seconds, so that's pretty fixed. And then you can dig into uh, the different user space services. And, you know, so that was our starting point. And then by digging through the services, we can get, uh, and removing some of the unneeded services, we could get the time down to uh, 18 seconds. So that was great, great win. You know, so it lets you control that amount of time. So I think we could, we could do a lot better, obviously, but I think that's a great tool to, uh, to get started. Um, and so at some point, so Socket Stream was nice, so I had the RPCs and things like that, but they re that meant I needed to write this RPC, um, RPC exposing code right, in, on the server side, and that kind of became annoying when I started wanting to test a loss of the services inside the hardware. 
So at that point, what I've done is to use the D node, which is actually uh, the ability to expose, okay, 10 minutes, to expose some of the, the functionality to, the, as objects, and at being able to make uh, calls from the client to the server, but also server calling back to the client. So it's been quite useful because I've been able to do so this is a, I'm going to skip the testing slide. So this is on YouTube. If you look for testing Lofilo, I explain how I've tested the unit at the software level. Um, and we, we I'm, so I'm able to load, for example, the Lofilo, uh, Lofilo object, which exposes the hardware, and, and bring that object locally and start making calls to it as if I had instantiated the object locally. And so this lets me do things like there's, there's four on board the RGB LEDs, and I want to write values to them, so I could use uh, the Lofilo and just write the values from the client side, and this would automatically be reflected on the server side and also to the hardware. And so underlying all of this is Lofilo.js, so you can find it again on GitHub. So basically the idea uh, is, to, is to get from the kernel kind of a registry of all the memory locations that are accessible and create an index of that. And this means uh, that, so I create this registry and I, I have this model, the JSON model of the hardware. So where all the register, the different memory locations of the registers are and what they, what, they, what they do, and in addition to that, I can add constants to the system. So this is just an extract of the full JSON representation of the hardware. So this is very useful because JSON is basically the language of the web right now, so of JavaScript, right? So you can take that object and really easily parse it and use it, um, both on the server side, the node.js, and the client side. And so this is what the Lofilo instantiation looks like. And yeah, so learning more. Um, so this, this is the updated recipe, okay? So I've talked about a lot of things, but basically, you know, uh, it's, it's actually a lot of work. And I think uh, we're definitely not finished on this platform. But uh, yeah, so you, 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 you need to be ready <laughs> if you're building a hardware platform to spend a lots and lots of time uh, building it and doing the software. And it's, it's just been a great, great experience. I've been very lucky to, um, to work with, uh, with great people. And so this is the status. And so we have a small batch to produce. So we're not selling right now. We're not in the development zone all because we're looking for funding. So after a year of doing development from our own you know, pockets. Now we, I've gone back to consulting to make some money. So this is a sister project. And there's uh, obviously lots of things we could do uh, for, for this project to, to take it forward. And yeah, so this is, if you're interested, you can talk to me. And thank you to Xiu Li. So this is the hardware engineer I was talking about that I met in Shanghai. So really top class, and he's, he's gone to pursue a doctorate in the University of Michigan. And these are the guys that were testing, the, the, from Metroid, that were testing the actual board. After I blew up the first one, they came to the factory and helped test the hardware. So I'm very thankful to them, me and my wife, and thank you. This is it. Any questions? Uh, I sort of presume that you speak Chinese. Is no, that, I don't. No? no? Your wife? Yeah, my wife does. Does it That's help? why she was in charge of all the shopping, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just wondering if, if you are uh, uh, planning to uh, create some hardware in China, if it helps if you, if you speak Chinese or, or have someone uh, who speaks Chinese. Yeah, I mean, it's as easy as finding a Chinese wife, right, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I think it's possible in I, I think it's possible to do business um, in China with without maybe knowing ch uh, Chinese that much. I mean, I think you should learn it if you're there, of course. But um, 
you definitely need a partner. You need a very strong partnership, and that's what's always difficult to find in a startup, right? You need some a partner that you're going to be, you know, as strong as that you're going to be able to live with um, for a long time and work very closely with. So that's what's the key here, I think. And and I think it's really there's some sort of some benefits actually of being an expat in China. You know, there's some positive and negative prejudice. So you just need to focus on the positive and have a partner uh, being able to back you up for the rest. Yeah. I was just going to say, Ricky, I really liked your video of the production line there. And, and as a software engineer, an embedded software engineer graduate, I was really lucky to spend a week working on a production line in Ireland cool. doing um, network hardware and stuff. Yeah. And it was uh, one of the best experiences of my life. Absolutely. And, um, I'm just thinking, uh, as uh, software people or even hardware people, are there opportunities for us to actually go and see production lines and actually see things like that happening? Because it's amazing to watch those machines. And do they ever open the factories and let people go in and see them and see things happening? Or I, I think I think if you if you were taking the role of uh, potential customers and you wanted to to go and, and visit the factory, I think they, it could be arranged. I think they would be open to that. And I think that's probably something we need to organize with the hackerspace locally. <coughs> when we have a lot of foreign visitors is to go visit these factories and see the actual process of building. So that's, yeah, something we'll, we'll do in the future. Can we expect to see you on Kickstarter or something? So I, so my, the thing is, Looking at the cost of the platform, so from what we've we've done in the competition, the, actually the hardware competition is very, very intense, right? I think we've got a great platform in terms of quality, and some of the concepts are really interesting, but it's very difficult to be successful in the hardware business. I think you need very strong backing to, to do it. And Kickstarter, for this project, is harder, because the price point is much higher, so it's much more difficult to get that critical mass that you would get. So it's not like a no-brainer purchase, like, okay, a $10, $20, uh, you know, Kickstarter, where you'll say, like, okay, why not? You know, this one is, is two, three hundred, four hundred dollar US for one device. So it's, it's something that, you know, it's much harder to get into. So we've talked about Kickstarter, but I think what we need is really um, a big electronics manufacturer willing to, to take that forward. Hmm. What do you, what, what's the status of the funding? Are you looking for funding locally in China or, or are you looking for US funding? There's, there's no funding you... in China. <laughs> okay, yeah. So there's very, the VC, um, you know, is very underdeveloped. So if you wanted to make money, you need to look at, I mean, the best place is California, right? That's where you find the, the actual money. Now the question is like, you need to make it into a business pitch and you need to make, convince people that this is going to be the next big thing, right? And that probably means bringing the price, you know, building enough quantity that you can bring the price below 100, so that everyone can own one. So that's that's a that's a lot of money, because we're talking about 100,000 units or something. And, and is there a market for 100,000 units, right? So that's the other question. So that really touches on the point I wanted to get to. Given the price point and the level of capability that you've built into this, what do you see as the application? Right. So. I mean, I think there's a lots of uh, potential for uh, on the robotic side. I think we're going to see in the future, like in the very close future, like a really emergence of robots everywhere, and and these robots are going to be internet connected. So I think that kind of platform is interesting for that because then you're combining, you know, the Linux operating system very powerful, and with 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 doing a lots of like the sensors and control in the hardware. And, and key to that is going to be to make it very easy to do FPGA uh, development. And that's difficult right now because the two major player, Altera and Xilinx, are actually stupid about their development tool. They, 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 they make it very restricted. Uh, the, the free version only compiles on one core. It's like really totally crazy. It's like they don't want anyone to get into FPGA development. And I think one of the solutions to that is actually taking uh, the compile chain and putting it in the cloud. So isolate that stability 
under a web API and let people just focus on their very log code or their VHDL code on their side inside a very uh, extensive framework so that you can compile and create the images easily, send them to the cloud, get the image, binary image back, and upload it to the FPG on the hardware. So that's like the big, I think the big opportunity here is, is this like very dynamic hardware that we can see. It's very powerful. Other questions? Yeah? Okay, I think we just stop it here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.